Welcome. Uh, we already had some of an introduction here. So today's, uh, I decided to give a talk. Well, actually, uh, I gave this talk back in 2014 at uh, Linux Plumbers in Dusseldorf. And this is where the talk, actually, Brendan Gregg, I first met Brendan Gregg, and he said that was the most technical talk I've ever seen. And then I seen him recently at uh, LCA, and he said, you, or scale, I think it was in scale, and he says, you need to get this talk again, but this time get it recorded, because they had issues with the recording back in 2014, and it wasn't recorded, it was lost. So he says, you need to give this talk again. So I'm like, you know, maybe I'll do it at Kernel Recipes, because I know it's going to be recorded. So I said, okay, I'll do this again at Kernel Recipes, and then I didn't think about it. I'm like, okay, recycling talks are awesome, because you don't really have to do much work to put them together. So, you know, I did my, on the way here, in, on my layover in um, Detroit, I wrote my RT talk for yesterday. And then Sunday, I get here, I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just go and I'll, you know, add the, our, the VMware logo slides, because now I work for a new company, I work for VMware now, uh, and I'm like, I'll get VMware and put the slides up here, they're the ones that, you know, sponsored me to come here, and they're sponsoring this event, and I'll do this, and as I'm going through the slides, I'm like, huh, we don't do it this way anymore. Huh. A lot changed in five years. Crap. I ended up rewriting the entire slide deck. And there's one slide I actually did a cut and paste for, and I found out it's wrong. <laughs> As I was reviewing, I went, oh, OK. Anyway, let's start. This is about uh, modifying the Linux kernel, where it all started, while it's running. No, oh, I have to turn this thing on. This will work. And I don't have a, I think that would help too. Boom. So this is about, when I say F-trace, a lot of people think it's a whole tracing utility. A lot of times when we mention F-trace, they think the ring buffer and all that. Really, that's all tracing. F-trace really doesn't mean that. That's really, F-trace is the function tracer, and, and actually more accurately, it's the function hook. It's actually what hooks into the, um, the functions, and perf uses it. Um, it's what the function graph tracer uses. DAC tracer, K probes uses it. System tap uses it. PStore uses it. Uh, BPF will soon hopefully be using it as well. So really, when I say F-trace, it's actually the hook into the kernel, uh, into the, the kernel functions. Uh, sometimes you generically say F trace to mean the whole tracing system, but I really call that the tracing system. It's not the same. So when I do go into the TraceFS system, uh, to really activate F trace, you just go into you know, sys kernel tracing, which is the TraceFS directory. I echo function into current tracer, cat trace, and then I see all the functions that are happening on my kernel live. So it's pretty cool, something you could do at home. Um, Function graph tracer is built on top of the function tracer, and it also records the return address, so you get to see when a function enters and when a function exits, and you can actually watch how it looks like C code being executed on your laptop. So don't worry about this. This isn't part of the talk. This is something we need to talk about later. One of the unique things about this is the fact that it records, it actually keeps a table of all the functions that it can trace, and I'll be talking about that later in the talk, and you could actually say, I want to trace just a few functions. And actually, not only was ftrace the first uh, one to really modify the running kernel live, it was also the first one to put glob expressions inside the kernel. <laughs> and it's actually extended. Today, there's a lot more glob expressions within the kernel, but ftrace is the one that um, started it all. So you get to do sked, star, sked, star, and get every single function that starts with sked or has sked in it. So how does this work? Well, GCC has this profiling option that's been there for ages. Well, it costs dash PG, and this is something that the uh, latency tracer from the real-time patch used that Ingo Molnar uh, had. And it would actually insert this uh, magic function called mcount, just after it set up the stack frame. So when a function enters, it'll set up a stack frame, th stack frame put in this call mcount, and, and it'll let go. It'll do it to every single non-inline function. So this is a way, it was supposed to be a way to profile functions. That's what it was made for. And we kind of abused this uh, functionality to say, okay, let's do more than just profile it. Let's add tracing to it. Let's record it. Because you get from this M count, you could get not only the function, but the parent that called that function, which is really nice. Uh, it requires a trampoline to call C code. So you can't just have it call, uh, M count call some C function because it's, it doesn't set up the C register or the registers properly, so you'll crash your machine if you did that. So it has to call a trampoline that sets up, saves registers, and then it calls a C function. And it, but the M count requires um, uh, frame, uh, frame pointers because it sets up a frame and then puts there. And as adds overhead and it causes issues. So um, Andy Clean uh, wrote a extension to um, GCC and added a, um, dash mf entry, which is different than mcount. 
Uh, it's similar. You do dash PG and dash MF entry, and instead of putting the call after the function frame, it puts it at the very beginning of the function before it does anything, which is kind of nice because you don't need frame pointers to do this, to use it. So also, because frame pointers do add overhead, and the first time when we added ftrace, and ftrace um, is low overhead, uh, Red Hat wouldn't put it on the production system because it required frame pointers, and frame pointers slowed things down, and they didn't want frame pointers um, in their kernels. So a typical function, this is actually cut and paste from um, recent uh, code. Believe it or not, that's, that's how big schedule is. Uh, <laughs> So if you look in the, the you know, kernel slash uh, sched slash core dot c, you'll find the function schedule. And yes, really, but this is, all, this is all inline functions. So this is actually a much bigger function than what you see in the C code. So this all gets pulled in. We don't see all this. This is all inline functions. But this is basically a typical function call. Everyone knows this. Very simple. OK, when I gave this talk in 2014, someone said, whoa, that was shocking. So I, I now have a warning for everyone. The following slides may not be suitable for all audiences. They contain assembly. <laughs> and machine code. I, I'm sorry, I, I shock some people now. Um, but this is, when you disassemble uh, that same thing, this is actually, I did an dump and then did cut and paste from dump and threw it in there. And this is what you see, okay? You know, starts off pushing RBX and using RBX later on. You know, that's actually, I believe that's current, and then, yeah, that's the current task, tells you right there. And then, you know, it takes a uh, index off of the current and then puts it to A and test A. So it's probably the preempt, see if preemption's enabled or whatever, so that's what that's doing. But when you add dash MF entry, you get this at every line. Basically, everything's exactly the same. By the way, the M count code, this would completely change. But with the F entry, the code is pretty much exactly the same. It doesn't modify the code, but it get, adds this alt call F entry. So when I first did this, I was like, um, added this, Ingo's like, well, can we get this running on production systems? I said, well, to run on production systems, it has to have like, basically no overhead, um, or at least in the noise, uh, if we have it disabled when we boot up. So the first thing I did is like, I added, OK, now this says F entry. When I did this, it was M count, but that's another story. But anyway, I compiled with and without you know, uh, F trace. And I said, OK, I just put the F entry, just put the return. So every call would just boom, 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 boom. So that was the shortest thing I could do. So it calls. I said, let's see what the overhead is of just everyone calling a no op function. Well, when I ran hack pinch on this, it was a 13% overhead. No, no distribution would deliver a kernel that gave 13% overhead for a feature that very few people use. So this can't work. Ingo asked, do you think we could convert these to no-ops or something? So I said, sure, let me try. And I'm like, OK, how do we do? How do we convert them to no-ops? You know, they add, but there's no way to find them. So I said, you know what? Let's see if we can find them at compile time. So I created this uh, thing called record M count. It originally was a Perl script, which when I added, it would do an obj dump of every object file. It would scan, read, it used Perl to read the file, and then it would create an array, and then it would compile that into an object, and then relink it into the original object file. This did it, so when you added ftrace on your kernel, it did this for every single object file on your build, and it slowed the, uh, slowed the build down quite a bit. In fact, they, Thomas kind of said, what the hell's going on? And, uh, but at the same time, I also created make local mod config, which shrunk the times of compiling. So no one noticed that I extended the time, and I shrunk it at the same time. That was, that was you know, I, I learned from Thomas how you could trick people. Uh, so, but the, uh, later we got written in C, which makes it much, much faster. So it just is an elf parser that reads the uh, object file. It'll go through, find the uh, F entry locations, and then it creates this section called M count, or uh, M count loc, which is, you know, you know, it's no longer uses M count. We still use the same section name, because why, why change it? And we put in all the F entries into it. So basically, oh, by the way, um, any clean was, it was still active in GCC, and he added in GCC 5 dash M record M count that does actually this for us. So it actually removes record M count from the, from the meeting in the kernel. But um, I'm going to explain what record M count did anyway. 
So basically, record M count would actually go through and read the, like, you know, here, kernel sched core.c, find all the call entries in, so you have, you know, schedule, yield, this, this, find them, create this section called M count loc, and add the address, usually just a, a reference to it. So we'll put in all the references to where these are located. It's a little more complex than this, but I don't have time to go into the details. And then what it do, it will relink it, it will create this, it will then put the section right into the, the object file. And then we used linker magic, which is quite off, this is very, very popular in the kernel. Kernel does lots of linker magic. Uh, if you go to this vmlinux.lds, uh, you'll see lots of fun things. Now what we do is basically we create two variables, start mcountloc and stop mcountloc. These variables, if you search all the C files and all the header files, uh, you might, well, see them in header files, you'll see them declared probably, or you'll see them in, file, in C files where they're declared, but you'll never actually see them defined. And if you don't know about linker magic, you could be ripping your hair out and say, where are these variables defined? But they're not defined by C. The linker actually magically creates them and then links them into the system. And does, it's done in this file where we actually say, okay, we're going to put start here. We said we put the section here and stop here. So when the linker links the whole VM Linux into one, takes all the object files and makes one, your VM Linux file, it will create two variables here and where the section is. So now I could find where that section is when I run the kernel. By the way, uh, that's the Parsec architecture. For some reason, it doesn't like mcount. It uses some strange something. I don't know. I'm not responsible for that. So basically, the linker magic, so you have all your object files. The linker magic will actually just put everything in, creating our two variables that we want. And for the address location, so where this starts. And then when the linker is finally done, it converts it into actual hard addresses. So what does this look like? It's an array. So what we do is on boot up, we just scan the array, which finds all the locations we want and convert them to no ops. Great. The system boots up, nothing's running. The first thing we do is just whoop, get all our no ops. Andy Clean is still active. <laughs> he also add uh, dash m no op m count that did this for us. And so it gave you the array. You still get the m loc, loc uh, m the uh, m count loc, and then he just converts to no op. So on boot up, we don't actually have to do this. We just say, okay, we just need this. But the problem is on boot up, we still do this. We delete that section. It goes away. We don't want that. We don't need it. But we do. We do need that information. We just don't like the way it's used. So m count loc is not enough for us, but we because we need to not only do we need to know where these are, we need to know state as well for each of those locations. So we create this thing called the dynamic f trace um, structure that records um, all the uh, addresses. And this is, by the way, this is my cut and paste error because I said m count that should have been f entry. Um, but Kate's all the X and flags and gives you this struct thing. So remember, we're making this for every single function in the kernel. You can have 40,000 functions in the kernel. So this, this structure you want very, very small. So yes, these are two unsigned longs. So on 64-bit, that will be 16 bytes total. But then you say, what's the structure here? Well, on x86 six, or normal x86 code, it's a no-op structure. It does nothing. So if you look at it, it all we ha it, this is like doesn't exist. You only have these two. So why do we have this? Well, because PowerPC needs to require module, it does things differently for modules, and you not only do it, does it, think, does it differently for modules, you need the module information uh, for each record that is in that module. So what we do is, we, I might be able to work around to get rid of this, because this is a lot of overhead on, it's another pointer for every single thing, and I think I might be able to rewrite the structure to make this better for PowerPC so it doesn't add all this extra data. Anyway. <clears throat> So what we do is we have to copy this data and put it, fill it into the structure. So after we do this, we create a bunch of pages. Um, I'm not going to go into the details about the pages or how we do it, but we sort it so we have quick, quick lookup. It's sorted by the address, because a lot of things in the kernel, like kprobes, needs to know, is this address in uh, ftrace function? It uses this table to find it, so it has to be sorted. And <clears throat> when you boot up, if you do a grep of your D message, it will show you how much data, how much data ftrace is wasting on your, or how much memory ftrace is wasting on your machine. So on a normal Fedora Core 29, uh, I got what? Uh, there's 39,000 entries with, that takes up 150 um, pages, 4K pages, for a total of about you know, 630 kilobytes of memory, which is, you know, most people have gigabytes, so you know, 630, it's just a little over half a meg. 
But that's 39,000 functions that it's tracing. So before we delete the section, we copy it over, we copy all that data over into here, and we add the, like, the flag. So that's what it looks like for our array of all the functions that ftrace can trace. So when you cat, if you go into sys ftrace, or what's it, slash sys, slash kernel, slash tracing, you'll see this file called available filter functions. By the way, I have to ask, how many people have used ftrace? I mean, okay, good, good, good. So if you cat available filter functions, you're wondering where these function names come from, it's just reading that table. And that's the order, it goes right by the order, so if you want to know the order, remember, it's not sorted by name, it's sorted by address. So actually, you can figure out the addresses, how they are related with each other. And what's, this is another thing where people ask me, you know, hey, I want to trace, say, two functions. I want to trace default lsync and sked idle. So I write into set ftrace filter, and then you could add another file or add another function by doing a concatenation. But when I cat it, it's in reverse order. It doesn't do it in the order I put it in. I said, well, the only thing you're doing is you're setting flags in the table, and then it goes, reads that table, and prints out what finds in the, te in the, in the table of those flag set. So the order will still always be dependent on the ftrace pages. So if you're wondering why there's, they're not going to order, this is why. So like I said, we have to create states. So these are the bits that we use. I'm not going to go through all of them. But the first one is uh, uh, the counter. So every time, you can have more than one callback for every function. So when you want to trace a function, you want to hook to a function, you register yourself to it, and <coughs> then it will set a bit, a counter. Well, someone else could do it, and else. So we have to know how many uh, callbacks are being registered to a single function. So every single one of these functions has a counter to it. So the first 24 bits is a counter. Um, why is it 24? That's, I'm never going to have that many things. It's just that, well, I'm those bits are free. So I can actually shrink it more. Because when I first gave this talk, it, st it started at 29. So, you know, these 25 through 28 were added since then. Um, so I'm going to go backwards now. From 31, the, that's a bit that just says, we're tracing, we're not tracing. Now, there's two there's various states you have. You have, OK, this function wants to be traced. And then you actually have a state that says it's actually being traced. So if the counter is anything but 0, it wants to be traced. If the counter, that tracing bit's not set, it means it's not being traced. So when I go in through the enabling, the enabling is done the same way on all arcs. So I have to do this you know, very interesting. So it does a scan of the table, and it checks these states to see if they match. If they don't match, it says, oh, we need to make a modification here. So when it says, oh, we have a number here, and that bit's not set, that means we need to trace this function to enable it. Or when it goes to 0, we need to stop tracing it. So this is a way, so the 31 is saying is the actual state of the tracing, where 0 to 24 is I want to be traced, or I don't want to be traced. Same thing for bit 30, because some functions want a full stack, um, uh, wants to save all registers. Uh, K probes, when K probes wants to use ftrace, it has to simulate a int 3 breakpoint and an exception handler. So exception handler, when it happens, it saves all, we save all the registers, and then we go to uh, K probes, because K probes can modify the registers when it returns. So we need to have a way of having a state that says, or we want to save all registers. Because we don't want to always save all registers, because that takes a lot. You know, if we don't need to save all registers, why do that if you don't care about them? So you, you, function tracing could be quite impactful on the system. And if you want to trace everything, you want to be as least impactful when you're doing it. So we know when we want to trace all registers, or save all registers when we hit a function, or not enough. So that bit, again, bit 30 says there's someone that wants to have this. Bit 29 says we are doing it. So we have to know whether or not we switch what type of function we call. Do we save or do we don't save? So when we do the iteration, we check to see if those match. And if they don't match, we have to update the system to make them match. So basically, the way it works is if, OK, I start off. Here's our table and say this guy points to schedule, this one points to schedule idle. And then uh, I go ahead and bump. I set bit 30. Bit 30 means I want to um, this guy to save registers. This guy doesn't, so it has zero. So you see bit 30 set and bit one. So there's one, one user that wants to do this, one user that wants this, but no, it doesn't care about registers. This one cares about registers. So when we do the scan, when we convert it to when this guy is now calling registers, we set the bit 20, well, bit 31 gets set in both saying we're tracing, and bit tw um, uh, 30 gets set over here because we're saying, OK, we're also, or bit 29, whatever, we've got bit saying that we're, now it matches. So. Let's talk about modifying code at boot up, or modifying code at runtime, which is not the same as boot up. Uh, if you're on a uni processor machine, you could just modify code. Everything would be fine. Uh, just be naive. Just I want to update uh, a function or some code that's being executed. Just modify it. It's one CPU. You don't care. You can easily do that atomically. 
But when you're on an SMP machine, things get strange, especially because x86 doesn't have uniform instructions. You know, you can have a one byte size instruction or a 10 byte size instruction. And that means that there's no guarantee where the instruction will lie. It will, could lie across cache boundaries, page boundaries, and all stuff. And this comes up interesting when the, the CPU is doing all this magic to be highly performance, and it's prefetching and grabbing stuff. Well, things change while it's doing this. The, the CPU gets confused, and then you create something called a general protection flow. So basically, we want to go from here to here. Now, <clears throat> naively, if I want to just modify it, I could say, here's our code. This is a, this is a no op right there. And CPU, this is CPU 0, CPU 1, and this is what they see. The red is the end of a cache line. Blue is another cache line. Same here. That's why it's same here. So when I modify this guy, this guy doesn't see it yet because, you know, the CPU, boom. But then the CPU modifies, starts doing prefetching and prefetches you know, the second half, like say this guy did something in the second half, but didn't prefetch the first half here yet. Or so, or, so say, say it was already, but somehow, the, so the CPU, the cache line happened where this cache got updated where the first half didn't. And then when we execute it, we get this. The boom, crash. <laughs> the computer doesn't know what to do. And, it, and actually, you could, when I first wrote ftrace, I triggered this all the time. It was fun, especially when it, did the reboot. You just enable ftrace and the machine reboots. Oh, lovely. What happened? So how do we solve this? How do we get from this to this? Well, it took a lot of talking with Intel. To, we came up with an idea. And Intel wouldn't tell us if it would work or not. And it took a year. We implemented it and started doing it anyway. <laughs> Until, and then I think after a year or two, Intel said, yes, it's OK. You won't, it, you, it will work. But they were very reluctant in letting us know that it would work. So how do we do this? Breakpoints. So when we do this, the first thing we do is that. We change the CC, put the in 3 breakpoint in there, and how does this work? So once uh, any CPU, OK, we do the change, and we synchronize all CPUs. The way we synchronize all CPUs, you just send an IPI to all CPU, CPUs. And when we send an IPI, that will synchronize everything. So now it will see, it does a memory barrier. So it will see everything the way it should see everything. So when a CPU hits a breakpoint, it jumps to the interrupt routine, and it calls the ftrace interrupt a handler, which will say, OK, move the IP instruction five bytes forward, and then return, which means it just skipped whatever it there. So when we hit it, we skip over it and jump it. So the CPU never sees this part of the code, which means now we could f modify it. So we go here, we, s we add the input uh, in three, synchronize all the CPUs, change the rest of the code, synchronize all CPUs so everyone sees it, and then remove this breakpoint back to what we want. And this actually works. Intel finally, after several years, said, yes, it will work. <laughs> so when how do you register something? So register ftrace uh, function is how uh, per uh, K probes, VPF, everyone's going to, if they want a, uh, the hook to a function trace, they just call this. And to pass it, you need a F uh, trace operator. And there's two types. There's the static one, which is basically a structure that's allocated at boot time. It will never, it's there at boot, it'll be there when you shut down. It never gets modified. And then there's the dynamic ones that are done by perf will allocate something, K probes allocate something. And when F trace, when you go and create instance, instance buffers, which is multiple buffers in ftrace, it will allocate uh, dynamic ones too. And that, that's, you have to be careful about the dynamic ones. Um, so this is what the structure looks like. You can ignore everything. Really, func is the only thing you really care about. This just tells you what, this is the thing you designed. When you create an ftrace ops, you say func equals this function. And when you enable it, your, that function gets called. The local hash, I, you don't care about, but there's functions that we have uh, that will modify this. And this is how you say, I want to trace the schedule. I just want to trace this function. I want to trace all functions. So the hash, it's get put into a hash table that tells us how to or what should be traced. When there's multiple functions that need to be traced and certain uh, callbacks want different things. So when you look at it, we got this ftrace trampoline called ftrace caller, which saves the registers. Remember I said you can't just call C function. You have to do some special things. Save some registers, whether if it saves all registers or partial registers to call C code is dependent on which is it regs or not. Um, Say, oh, I got load registers there, but saves registers and calls, um, oh yeah, it loads, some, it loads the registers for the call, and then it calls ftrace stub and returns. So if you look in the C code, 
and you look at what ftrace caller is, this is what you see. Very useful, right? It's almost, it's almost worse than a no-op. It does a loop. So, so why, why do we do this? The reason why is because one thing is, well, today it even makes more sense because rep planes suck. Um, if we're modifying code, why don't we just modify that? So we actually mod we dynamically modify the trampoline. So when you add a function, it will actually modify the ftrace caller to call your function, which happens to be, by the way, your fops func pointer. And then what you call here, it calls this guy, goes back and restores it. That's how tracing works in the kernel. Great for a single callback. But what happens when we have more than one callback? Well, in this case, we have to iterate. So when we do this, we have our ftrace caller. Instead of calling your function, we, call, we say, oh, there's more than one function here. And this is determined by that table with when count is more than one. So when count is one, we know to just call this guy. If it counts more than one, we call multiple guys. And say, OK, we add a list function, and we iterate through, saying this guy will call this function. So and it uses, this is where it uses the hash table to look at the uh, IP address of um, the inst instruction pointer address, uh, the instruction pointer of uh, um, schedule and checks the hash tables to see do these guys want to be called. So let's say you have a function tracer that wants to trace all functions and then you have perf using the function tracer that just wants to trace the schedule and nothing else. So they're both running at the same time. This means that when we go to the list function we have to say hey who wants to trace sked idle? Do you? No. Do you? Yes. Who wants to trace you know, condition resched? Do you? No. This? Yes. Who wants to trace CO? You, know, you get the point here. Who wants to trace schedule? Yes, yes, OK. So it's got to ask everyone each time. That, that takes a little bit of overhead. So this is what it looks like. You know, when we first, this is the way we first did it. And we boom, 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 boom. And then we call the listener and we do this. But because we have the state data within the table, we could be a little bit smarter about this. So what we do is we create a dynamic trampoline specific for the function tracer. And this is even on the top level. So we create a dynamic trampoline. We just allocate this put in call function trace right here, a direct call, and have these guys, these guys call directly to the direct, direct uh, dynamic trampoline straight to this guy. And this gets done, this is really fast, but this guy still has two callers, so it must call the list iteration and iterate through both of them. So what's the problem with dynamic trampolines? Well, you say, okay, we call here, we call our dynamic trampoline, we jump to our dynamic trampoline. At this point, we get preempted. OK? Because there's no way to stop this preemption from happening. Because let's say, because to say the scheduler, you always call schedule if preemption enabled. So that means preemption is going to be enabled, and we just jump to it. Before we execute the very first line, we get preempted. So we can't even put in a preempt disable there, because it's going to get preempted before we even get a chance to disable preemption. There's nothing that stops us from here. So we convert it to a no op. OK. And we're like, oh, we don't, there's no one tracing this anymore because this guy's preempted. He's maybe preempted by a, this RT task that's going on forever. This guy, was, this guy was pinned to a CPU that happened to have an RT task running on it. And it's going, this RT task is going to run for minutes. And this guy's just waiting to run. And he gets preempted. And in, in the meantime, I go and I disable function tracing. And everything's this, so function trace does it. So this is a dynamic trans trampoline. We can't just leave it around. It's going to cause a memory leak. So we have to free it. Whoop. Wrong button. We have to free it. So it disappears. A minute goes, the RT task is done. Wait, and the other guy, hey, I can run again. So he schedules. See a problem here? <laughs> Boom. Crash. Boom. How do we handle that? Anyone have any ideas? Shut up. <laughs> He's the RCU guy that I talked about earlier. <laughs> so of course he knows. Um, well, would RCU work? How many people here know how RCU works? Well, I'm glad there's some very few people hands get up, and most of you guys are like uh, mine. Uh, so it's good. Joel will explain it. So everyone's hands will go up after he talks. Um, but anyway, if you just do get RCU, right? Which to do this, it's not good enough. This actually won't work. RCU is going to say, oh, it's going to go and hit. But this guy's still preempted. It doesn't care about preempted tasks. Because it's, it doesn't have any, it, this task doesn't hold any RCU locks. So how, do you, how will RCU work? It will work. But I had to go and ask Paul, could you do me a favor? I need a new RCU uh, flavor. Is it flavor? That's what they call it. A new RCU flavor. It's called um, RC, call RCU tasks. 
So call RCU tasks was added in 318 by Paul McKenney. Thank you. It's something like that because I begged him to add this because I wanted dynamic depth trace to work. And when you call synchronized RCU tasks, it does something different than any of the other synchronized RCUs. It actually waits for all the tasks to voluntarily schedule. So if a task is preempted, it will wait until it wakes up and then calls actual either call schedule or goes into user space. Those are the two quizzing states for RCU tasks, which is a lot longer than any of the, it's one of the longest RCU things. In fact, when he, did, or when he first ran his RCU torture, I think one, this took actually minutes before it would re, like, go. It's like, wow, this really is a long time. He's like, are you sure you want this? I'm like, yes, I want this. Um, <clears throat> so what's nice about this, by the way, F-Trace added it in 412. I was lazy. I like even like he did. It. I'm like, thank you, but I never got around to implementing using it. <laughs> it wasn't until Linus was yelling at Paul McKenney about getting rid of all the RCU flavors, and Paul said, "Hey, there's no user of you know. <laughs> I created this RCU task for you. There's no user of it. I'm going to get rid of it." I'm like, I'll add it now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so have that put the that put the on the to-do list right to the top. Got it done. And actually, I'm not the only user now. There's actually several other users of RCU tasks now. Because it's actually a very, very, anytime you have, oh, there's a lot more dynamic trampolines being created. And every time you have a dynamic trampoline, RCU tasks is how you could free it. So we're getting more and more of that with more modification of code. And this is working nicely. And how this works is this. So remember when we got preempted? And when we called free, you can't call free right now. How do we know we stop? We call RCU tasks on this. And what it's going to do, it's going to wait until all tasks schedule. Now, here's a rule. The one rule is that dynamic, um, these trampolines are not allowed to schedule. Uh, it can be called in any context. It can be called in NMI context. So you really don't want to schedule. So you know that you can't call schedule. So that's how we know that's a quiz state. So now, it, OK, this guy finally gets scheduled. So minutes and later go on. It doesn't matter. It could be years. If this RT task is going on, it starts this guy. It could be years. And you'll just be waiting for you know, your F trace uh, disable to and it just sits there. Why is it taking years to end? Because you have some RT tasks waiting for you. It finally schedules out, jumps out, and now all tasks are scheduled. Now we get free and not worry about it crashing. So going back to regs, now if we were able to save registers and do stuff, there's a bit you could set in your ftrace ops that allows you to modify one specific register. Uh, if you set it, you're the only allows one callback to set this bit. It's, I want to change the instruction pointer. So think about that. You come back, you change the instruction pointer, and when you return, you don't return back to the function you called. So who do you think uses this? This is how live kernel patching works. So you call schedule. You have a buggy schedule. Say, OK, schedule we, it needs to be fixed. So we say we got to fix it. So how we do it? We well, there's a lot of magic to do the switch. So they will take a module and load in schedule fix, which is the schedule function that's actually now the fixed version of it. It calls ftrace, ftrace handler with that bit set. We call the kernel patch. It changes the IP to equal sched fix. And when this thing returns, it jumps here, not here. So now you're running fixed code. Thank you. So, did that seem like 104 slides? Yes. <laughs> Questions? Come on, I want to throw this at someone. OK. <laughs> Seriously? Or I just want to be thrown at? What? Let's see if it works. Might have to, yeah. OK. Uh, you appear concerned by the size of your uh, DNF trace uh, array. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you, you could cut it in half by using only 32 bits uh, for the flags, obviously, and uh, 32 for the pointer by storing an offset relative to a reference uh, function instead. Um, it's questionable with the modules. Because we, we, we have to do with the modules. But we could, here's the thing, this is where, remember I said I want to fix the dynamic things, and I said there's a way to do that. Because remember I talked about the grouping of pages? Because that that was a lot of code has been done on how to group the pages, and actually, if I put the uh, um, at, if I put attributes or flags or, or say to the pages, 
I could then do that. It could actually say the page will be of this type or this type. And I could change the type of pages. Because I have one page or one huge groups of page of um, VM Linux. And then each module has its own. So I could actually do the VM Linux one, cut that one in half. And then have the modules be, or actually, no, I could keep them all small and just have the, in the descriptor, where's the offset? So I could probably, I could, I probably should probably do that. Yes, that's a, thank you. That's a good, uh, something to advance or help. Send me an email, remind me. I put a bugzilla in it. <laughs> Very beginning of your presentation, the, what, is there any reason why you couldn't, oh, you don't need to go there. Is there any reason why you don't do all the patch uh, in, in the binary uh, when you, when the system boots up and you're making the table? Wait, you mean, um, for uh, which what, was it? Did I do this? Uh, no. You mean this part here? Yeah. So wait, what? What do you mean? And oh, why did I do it per object file and not just do it at the very end? No, no. Um, instead of when you have all the all your VM Linux uh, <coughs> at the very last stage, you can remove all the calculus with nodes. Why don't you do it on at build time? Oh, why did I do it on build? Like why I do it in the beginning? Um, I've actually had code to do it at build time too. And one thing was, it was more actually, well, we do it at build time now. When you put the dash M, well, GCC does it at build time. Uh, it was also partially done for verification. Uh, I, liked the, I liked the change. I actually don't like the fact that we have no ops there because a lot of times someone will change something in the code where it makes a page unwritable. Or, there's a lot of things about read, write of the uh, modifying the code. So a lot of times we keep all this text uh, write, read only. And if something screws up, uh, I detect it right at boot. So if we just have a co-ops, you won't detect until you enable F-trace. Um, and I found a lot of bugs from that, you know, happens, bugs happen just by people booting it. But now, I, it's usually now I don't find these bugs with the no-op calls, I don't find the bugs until I get it and I run it. I'm like, oh, something, or someone else gets, gives me a bug report. Hey, F-trace broke. I'm like, why? And then find out that it's because something changed in the read-write. That's, that's why I like this, but it's, it's the, probably the better way to go. you brought it up. Uh, what's the plan with BPF and F-Trace? Um, he'll talk about that later. <laughs> no, uh, I actually, the uh, only reason I brought it up is because Alexi says uh, we need to sit down and talk tomorrow. <laughs> so I know it's coming, I don't know why. <laughs> so I can answer that at the end of the conference, not now. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Oh. For the log patching, uh, for the kernel log patching, the, so the last slide, I think, um, do you update back the end count log array with the new schedule fix? Yes, uh, that was actually in the original code, or actually in my original um, talk. I'm wondering if I even have that up here at all. Uh, let's see here. Is this the, uh, okay. Um, so I, my original talk I had, which was, let's see, it's 2000, what? Uh, number, f this one, that's it. It's, yeah. You like that? I actually talked about that. Another solution, having this, convert in straight instead of this, having this. That's what you asked. Uh, we talked about this, and we were going to implement this. And there's something is something is one is they said don't worry about it. The performance isn't that bad, not nearly at all. And the second thing is this gives us um, because they like to revert things. There's certain things where they want to because now they want to revert things. And what if you do it this way, you can't revert. So you're just going to keep adding code. And this is also the way we do it now. Currently do it, uh, we could audit it. We could audit what's going on. Once we do this, it's, you can't audit what's going on. It's, hit, it's more hidden, and it's harder to see things. Um, that's why we actually, for security reasons, we found out that the original way, which is quote unquote not as efficient, is actually better for security, better for rebasing, better for uh, versioning, and everything else. So actually, they said, don't do this. In fact, they said, don't implement it. We're going to keep it the way we have. That's the other thing that I had to take away from my talk. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, thank you.